Okay, good morning, everybody. And Hazrat Baruch, thank you for joining us on this beautiful Wednesday morning as we are uh, getting ready for Perashat Aharemot. But as well, we know that we are in the time of year in between Pesach and holiday of Shavuot, and it is customary to study Pirkei Avot. Pirkei Avot is one of the Masechets of Shas. Okay, so we know that we have Torah Shebechtav, which is the written Torah, which is what we study every single week. Pirashat Bereshit, Noah, Lech Lecha, right? The weekly Pirasha. That's the written Torah. That's all right here. Okay, that's all in this. This is what Moshe got. He got written. He wrote it down on Har Sinai. Okay, he didn't get it. He didn't get it all on Har Sinai written. He he only got till what happened, and then he wrote the rest. God gave him the rest to write as he went. Yes, but eventually this was all written by the end of his life. And then Moshe also got on Har Sinai. Torah Sheba'al Peh. Torah Sheba'al Peh is the oral Torah. It is the, uh, I guess you could say, commentary or elaboration on what's written in this in this Chumash. Okay? Now, Hashem couldn't give Moshe the oral Torah also written for many reasons. The simplest reason is because it would actually be literally too heavy. Did you ever see a Shas? Okay? It's very, very big. And practically speaking, it doesn't make sense to give it to him uh, written. So he gave it to him orally. Hence the name Torah Shebe'al Peh. It's the oral Torah. So he said to Moshe, here it says, shake a nice fruit. Okay. But then, then he told him orally, verbally, by the way, when I say nice fruit, I didn't mean a mango or a pomegranate. I meant... Etrog, okay, that's what I meant. So he gave him the written, and then he elaborated on the written orally. So that's the Torah Shebechtav. So now, in the Torah Shebechtav, we know how many how many books do we have in the written Torah? How many books? Five. We should know this because we're just saying it. Who knows five? I know five, right? Five other books of the Uncle Moshi, nobody? Okay. Five other books of the Torah, right? So... Hamisha Chumshet, well, that's why it's by the way, it's called a Chumash. What's Chumash? The word Hamish, five. Okay? Uh, Chumash. Uh, right? The Ashkenazim say Chumash. So what's Chumash? Chumash, five. Okay. How many books of the Oral Torah? How many books in the Oral Torah? Six. Okay, so you have five books of the Torah. Tereshit, Shemot, Vaikrab, Bar Devarim. And then you have the six books of the Oral Torah. And here they are. You ready? Zera'im, Mo'ed, Nashim, Nezikim, Kadashim, Taharot, which is, which is, Zera'im deals with all of the laws of seeds, planting, uh, for primarily for the one that we know most is the laws of Brachot, right, what blessing to say on seeds and foods, so all the laws of food, that's going to be in Brachot, in Zera'im, that's the first book. The second book, Mo'ed, deals with all of the laws of holidays. Shabbat, okay? Holidays. Then, Nashim, all the laws that have to do with women and marriage. Ne Nun, the next one, Nezikin, is going to be the laws of damages. If I hurt one, if there's a lawyer and witnesses, all those laws of monetary disputes, okay? That's always very fun. People love that one. Because it's always, right? This guy's ox, hit that one. Who has to pay who? Right? People love that one because a lot of opinions and fighting and it's juicy. Right, Nezikim. Adashim deals with Korbanot. Taharot deals with purity and impurity. Okay, so again, that has to do today. The main one that we know today from that is we don't have today purity and impurity except for uh, Nida, the monthly cycle of the women. So that's again going to be found in the last book of Taharot. Okay, so we have Torah Shebechtav, Torah Shebechtav, five books in the, in the written one. Six books in the oral one, and each book has many, many uh, tractates, masechtot. Okay, masechet. So when you're learning shas, you go through each masechet. I think there's 36 masechtot to finish the Talmud. Okay, so the Talmud is made up of Mishnayot and Gemarot. Mishnah was written by the Tanaim. That's one, two liners. They're rather uh, very uh, just bullets, points, 
And the Gemara dissects and breaks down the Mishnah. That's what the Gemara does. Oh, the Mishnah said this. Why does it not say that? Why is it all listing uh, this example? Why didn't it bring uh, the other case? What is it all? But it contradicts that Mishnah, right? So you have Mishnah and then you have Gemara. Together, they make up the Talmud. Anyways, this is, again, this is really just a broader idea of understanding Torah, Shival Peh, and Talmud. Now, Avot is one of the Masechets, okay? So just like you have, uh, take a guess, guys. What would you call the Masechet that deals with the laws of the holiday of Sukkot? Masechet. Sukkah, very good. Okay, so that was easy. What would you call the one that deals here? How about this one? It's a Masechet called Masechet Pesachim. Okay, what do you think it deals with? Okay, very good. The holiday of Yom Kippur. No I'm kidding. Okay, the holiday of Pesach. Okay, and each one, right? Avot is one of the Masechets. Okay, so you open up the Talmud, you'll find Avot. It's there. Okay, but Avot we know deals with ethics. Avot deals with not halacha. It's very unique. It's different from any other Masechet in the entire Shas. Every Masechet deals with law, laws of blessing, the laws of prayer, the laws of Shabbat, the laws of Passover, the laws of uh, money, the laws of witnesses, the laws of finding and the lost item, right? All of a sudden, Masechet Avot doesn't deal with law, it deals with ethics, it deals with advice from the sages. Beautiful. It's a good, it's a good idea. It's a good book to have, by the way. It's a nice book to have. But let me ask you this. Which book, which of the six books of the Mishnah should Masechet Avot be found in? Where would you put this? If you're, let's say I said, okay, listen, Mr. Rabbi, you're compiling the Mishnah Yot. We have, we hear every book, we know where it belongs. Every every topic. Think of a topic in Chas, and you'll know. Any topic in Halakha, you'll know. Okay, uh, I don't know, uh, Purim. That's easy. Purim should go in the second one. Mohed. Easy. We know where that should go. Okay. Uh, how about um, real estate? Oh, that's that's money, law, dispute. That's going to go in the fourth one. Nezikim. Okay, that's good. All right. What about, uh, I don't know, uh, if, I, if, I, uh, if I became impure? Oh, that's easy. That's the sixth one. That's going to go with Tahor Tameh. For any area of halakha, you know where it fits into. Where would you place... Masechet Avot. This one that we're going to start learning now from Esaf Shavuot. Beautiful Masechet. Where would you place it? Where would you think is an appropriate of which which of the six volumes should it go into? So Avot goes into the into the fourth one, Nezikim, which deals really with damages. And the question is. Why is it in Nezikim? We're gonna we're gonna really today we're not gonna really get yet into the meat of the Masechet. We're gonna give just a general introduction and understand, and we're still gonna have beautiful lessons hopefully. But at least to understand why is Pirkei Avot where it is. Okay, so first we have to understand why is it in this tractate in general in in uh, not this tract in this vol in this volume of uh, Nezikim. Why is it here? Why do you, what does that have to do with damages? What does that have to do with money? This is about being a good person. It should go in any it should go in, in anyone. So there's many answers to this question. I'll share with you just a couple for today. Okay, number one, number one, very interesting, but you should know that out of these six volumes, like we said, Teraim, Mo'ed, Nashim, Nezikim, Kadashim, Taharot, you know which one is studied most by most yeshiva students? Most yeshiva students. Study which one out of these six? If you go to any yeshiva in Israel, most, most, 99% of them spend most of their day studying the fourth one. Nezikim, damages. Baba Kama, Baba Metzia, Baba Batra, Sanhedrin, Makot. These are all very, why? For A, A, they're very fun. They're very fun. I don't know if you ever went to a, a Gemara class with these, uh, in any of these Masechet, but they're very fun because you have this guy, he testifies against that guy, but then this one who's right and who's wrong. And there's always two sides and it gets the brain working, right? 
But also there's a lot of very important yesodot and principles and ideas in these masechets. So they study this. Uh, they usually, the yeshivot, this was the one that they focused on. Rabbi Uda Anasi, the one who compiled all the Mishnayot, he wanted the Talmidim to have good midot, to have good manners, to have good character. He had a brilliant idea. He said, you know what? If everybody is studying the fourth volume, let me sneak in a little bit, some pages of ethics. And then, by the way, they'll also read ethics. They'll read for the Kavot. So that's, that's one of the answers that's given. It's a very interesting answer. So, so really, really, the view dynasty did it in a uh, tactful way to try to encourage the students who are anyways learning, uh, you know, they're learning this book. It, it was like a trick that he devised to get them to start learning Midot Avot and good character and morals. So he threw it in because they're, uh, as they're reading all the interesting stuff, they'll come across uh, they'll come across also this very important masechet that deals again with character. This, by the way, also answers another masechet that appears in this volume, in the fourth volume, and that is masechet eduyot. Okay? Anyone want to take a guess of what masechet eduyot deals with? Now, again, I know what you're going to guess, and it's probably going to be incorrect. But you'll see why it's incorrect. What do you think? What do you think Masechet Eduyot deals with? So one would say, witnesses, very good. Thank you for guessing that. Hazar. But that's the wrong answer. Okay, that's the wrong answer. It sounds like witnesses, but it has nothing to do with witnesses. Eduyot, okay, it's actually interesting. So it's a, it's a mahalok, it's how to pronounce Masechet. But there were select choice Mishnayot that were undisputed that everybody agreed to. You know, many masek, many Mishnayot is Mahlokit. Usually, by the way, pay attention to what I'm about to tell you. If anyone ever asks you a halakhic question, I'm going to give you a one word answer that will always be the right answer. Mahlokit. <laughs> Mahlokit sounds also very smart. Wow, Mahlokit. Okay, the guy knows what he's talking about. <laughs> well, really, you have no idea. But it's probably always the right answer. There's always Mahlokit. There's always difference of opinion. Except on Masechet Eduyot. These, they had testimony, that's why it's called Ed, from testimony, testified that these are undisputed, unadulterated, authentic Mishnayot, all the way to Har Sinai. There's no dispute on these. And, the, and even the Masechet, Edudyot, is also known as Behirta, choices. That's, that Masechet, Edudyot, guess what? It also appears right here in the book of Nezikim. The fourth book. Why? Why is it in this volume of Nezikim? It has nothing to do with damages. Some topics deal with marriage, some this, some that. What is it doing here? The answer is, since everybody studied this Masechet, uh, this volume, everyone learned Nezikim, like we said. So also they threw in this very important Masechet, Eduyot, into this one, so that they'll study it as well, by the way. Okay, so beautiful. So we have one answer of why Masechet Avot is here. There is another very important answer, and that is, that is as follows. You know, sometimes there's a, there a saying that sometimes in life we get so focused on the trees that we lose sight of the forest. And that means that sometimes we forget, we, we lose sense of the bigger picture, right? We forget what the goal sometimes of raising children is. And we make it all about the rules, the rules, the rules, the rules. Wash your hands, don't get things dirty, do your homework. Right, which is important. It's important. As a teacher, there's rules. You have to do this, you have to do that. But sometimes, as we are studying the rules, we're enforcing the rules, but we forget why do we even have a school system to begin with? What is the goal of a school? The goal of a school is homework. The goal of a, right? Really, sometimes we forget the goal of a school is to raise healthy, proud Jewish children that will be proud in this crazy world of their Jewish identity to go into the world, right? So sometimes we forget that. And as we're giving our students so many rules and we get, we get stuck and we lose the soul and we lose the spirit and there's zero joy in learning and there's zero simcha and there's the rule of can't have sleepovers and you're not allowed to have a phone 
and you have to dress in a certain way, which again, I'm not saying they're not important. They are important. The rules are important. But sometimes when we get carried away with the rules and we forget what the rules are really there to accomplish, so we lost sight of the bigger picture. At the end of the day, a school must be able to say and look back after they after a kid goes through a system of 12 years of schooling. It, at least as a Jewish school, right? The goal should be come out happy to be a Jew, proud to be a Jew, excited to be a Jew, right? If we don't create those feelings, we failed. All the rules are pointless if you're not going to have that, right? The famous mashal that we give so many times about a, a kid who was getting married and the mother says to one of the brothers, listen, to, it's your brother's wedding today. Make sure you go to the wedding on time and make sure you don't bring your cell phone because I don't want you to get carried away. And make sure that you come showered and dressed and shaved. Ba, 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 ba. She gives him a whole list of rules. And the kid says, no problem. And he comes to the wedding and he comes on time. And he doesn't bring his phone. And he's showered and tuxedo. And what's he doing the whole night? He's watching the game on his friend's phone. Right? Dad. Because he comes, he says, Mom, I followed all the rules. I did everything that you said. Mother's crying. You missed the point. So we have to realize that the Torah as well has many rules. But sometimes we get so stuck on the rules of the Torah, we forget the point. Again, not that a person could avoid the laws and if they're just going to keep the spirit, then right, that's also wrong. You have many people that do the other way. Rabbi, I don't need to pray because I'm already connected to Hashem. You ever saw guys like that? I don't need to keep Shabbat because I already know that Hashem, right? It's a, you can't do that. Either. The rules are the rules. But the rules are also there to create a certain spirit and a tone and a mood. And if a person is going to have Shabbat and the whole, he's going to follow every single rule of Shabbat, but there's no soul of Shabbat. You know what I mean? A person can keep Shabbat from A to Z, but he didn't keep Shabbat. You have a person that follows all the halachot. Anything wrong, Rabbi, with keeping the TV on on Shabbat? No, nothing wrong. Can't, I can't show you in the halakha specifically where it says that it's asur. I don't know. I can't do that. If you, if you keep it on, if you walk by a bar on Shabbat and you have the, the game playing and you stay and you just watch from the streets, I can't tell you that you violated. You didn't keep Shabbat. That's not what Hashem had in mind. A person is going to keep the fast. He's going to not eat a single food on the entire fast day. Sits in his, sits in his house. Sits on the floor to Shabbat. No shoes. He doesn't even shower. He doesn't brush his teeth. He doesn't eat. Beautiful. But what's he doing the whole time? He's spending his whole day at the movie theater. Watching on his phone. Binging on Netflix. Or all these other beautiful apps. Right? What are you doing? That's the point of Tisha B'Av. That's what Hashem had in mind. So sometimes we, we forget why we're, we're doing what we're doing. It's very important once in a while. This is, right? Uh, schools, again, teachers always have meetings from time to time. And to just, sometimes it's important. Just like a, a coach has to call timeouts. Time out, guys. Let's uh, not forget, what are we here to do? Let's not forget, we're here to play defense. Don't forget to pass, Don't right? So sometimes we have to take a time out and remind ourselves what exactly are we trying to accomplish with our, again, job, in our day, in the family, in life. A guy once came to his rabbi and says, Rabbi, I went to Chas. And the rabbi said back, that's very nice, but did Chas go through you? How beautiful is that? So it's very nice that we can go through something, but it has to go through us. It has to penetrate. The story is told, I don't know again which yeshiva, if it's true or if it's made up, but it's a nice story about uh, the, the, the boys, they finished learning Masechet Abba Metziah. And towards the end of the, of the semester, as they were, they were done, and they spent a whole, can you imagine, a whole eight months learning from A to Z, all the laws of finders, keepers, a person loses an item, 
you have to claim it, you have to return it. So the rabbi, he 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 planted on the floor to the door on the way into the Bim Drash, he placed uh just a sweater. He put a sweater there. Anyways, boys are coming in and out, and uh, nobody bothered to pick it up. And the rabbi turned to the kids and he says, You know, we spent eight months learning, and every one of you, if I ask you questions, you'll know every single answer. But not one of you stopped to pick up the sweater. Not one person stopped to pick up the sweater. So that's an example of how, again, a person could learn all the laws, but it didn't penetrate. At the end of the day, if you're not going to stop and help and return the item, what are you doing all of this for? Uh, intellectual uh, exercise? Mental stimulation? Right? So sometimes, again, it has to, it has to become real. It has to become part of the person. And therefore, therefore, maybe that's another answer to our question. After a person studies Masechet, Baba Kama, Baba Metzia, you can't damage, you can't hurt, you shouldn't offend, right? All these laws, but sometimes the laws, they remain laws. They remain halakha. They don't become part of our lives. And therefore, Masechet Avot is tackling that specific idea that halakha must also penetrate our hearts. They must penetrate our lives. They must become part of what we do day to day and who we are. And therefore, it's not just about making sure to return the lost item. It's not about that if you go to court, you should testify tr truthfully. But also make sure that you smile at people. Make sure that you don't judge people unfavorably. You don't jump to conclusions. People benefit of the doubt. So that's what Avot addresses. I guess you could say that Avot is the soul, is the soul of the book of Nezikin, making sure that we don't get stuck on the laws, we don't get carried away, and we don't lose sight of the bigger picture. So Maseh that Avot is the very important soul. It puts it together. It's like this, it's like, you know what it's like? It's like the, the you know, sometimes a guy will come to the rabbi and say, Rabbi, is this uh, mutad? Is this allowed? Is this asur? Is it forbidden? Right? Says Rabbi, Rabbi say it's forbidden, not allowed. And the guy say, Rabbi, where, where? Show me where. Right? So the rabbi will, will say sometimes, jokingly, he'll say it's, it's in the fifth book of Shulchan Aruf. Because we know Shulchan Aruf only has four books. Right? But it's in the fifth book. What does the rabbi mean by that? What does that mean, the fifth book? He means it's, it's the unwritten. But sometimes in life, things don't need to be written. It's, it's obvious. I don't need to tell you. You didn't have. I didn't have to say that, right? Sometimes we'll give our kids rules, and then when when they're uh, when they're not when they're doing something mis, uh, you know inappropriate, they'll say, "Well, you didn't you didn't tell that to me, right?" What do you say back? You say, "I didn't have to." Some things are obvious. Some things are known. They're already understood. They're self-explanatory. So so this is the fifth volume of Shulchan Aruch, if you will. So Masechet Avot is the fifth volume. And it's and it goes, there's no better place than in Nezikim, where a person where sometimes again forget what the goal, uh, what the goal is. Okay. Now, besides for addressing this general question of why is Masechet Avot in this overall book of Nezikim, we have to now see where is it specifically within the book. Because again, just imagine. Just imagine you have the book of Bereshit, but the book of Bereshit has many parashiyot, right? Bereshit, Noah, Mizdecha, Bayera, Hayesara, Toldot, right? Many 12 parashiyot in the book of Genesis. So too, the book of Nezikin has many masechtot. Okay? I'll read to you, just pull it up one second. I'll read to you which masechtot are found in the book of Nezikin. Take a look. A lot. Baba Kama, Baba Metziah, Baba Metra, Sanhedrin, Makot, Shevuot, Eduyot, Avodazara, Avot, and Horayot. So there are 10 Masechet in this book. Where are you going to put Avot? Where is it? Why is it where it is specifically within the Masechet? So, meaning again, I understand why you put it in this overall book of Nezikim. We had two answers, very nice answers. But now, where in the book are you going to put it? Beginning, in the middle, in the end? This is another question. 
The Rambam and others explain as follows. They say in their version, we're going to have two different versions today. In one, in some versions, it appears right after Masechet Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin, you should know, by the way, Sanhedrin is not a Hebrew word. It became incorporated into Hebrew. Sanhedrin is actually Greek. Okay? Uh, in Hebrew, the word Sanhedrin is not, doesn't exist. It became Hebrew. But it, it's from Greek. Right? Really, it's uh, the way to say Supreme Court in Hebrew would be Bedin Hagadol. Big court. Sanhedrin, we took from Greek. A lot of words, by the way, from Greek uh, appeared into uh, into our Mishnayot, as an example, the word Achsania, host or guest, the word Istanis, when it was very uh, delicate or cold, right? The word uh, Zug, Zug, a pair, doesn't appear in the Torah. Zug, really in the Torah, when it says that two animals came at a time to Noah's Ark, it says Shnaim, Shnaim, two, two. The word Zug, again, came from Greek. So a lot of words uh, that we have in our Mishnayot that we use uh, day to day um, uh, come come from uh, okay. Anyways, there's a lot. There's a, there's a there's a long list of, of words like that. But anyways, Sanhedrin is one of them, and Sanhedrin means court. Okay, court. Now, why would why would the Masechet uh, Avot come right after Masechet Sanhedrin? I would appear right after this one, after the laws of judges and courts, right after comes the laws of ethics. Why? So there's two answers to this. One answer is addressing the community. The other answer is addressing the judges. So let's go one at a time. The first answer is talking to the community. The community, the, the, the layman, the person who's coming to courts. After sometimes you go to a judge and he gives you a, a, a ruling. You're not satisfied with it, right? And a person may sometimes go to a rabbi. The rabbi said it in his speech that it's asur, it's forbidden. The guy didn't like that. Say, who is this rabbi I think he is? What does he know? Uh, he's not such a big rabbi anyways. I heard it's allowed. I don't know if it's really not kosher. I think it is kosher. I uh, I don't know. I want to see a second opinion on that one, rabbi. Right? You ever, you ever saw guys that talk like that sometimes? Right, all of a sudden the guy became a rabbi overnight. Right, the rabbi said something and he argues. <laughs> he wants to say, No, I disagree. I don't think it's so true what you just said. Based on what are you saying, that you study all the all the areas of halakha that have to deal with this topic. But sometimes, so when we don't like a ruling, we dispute it. Right? Kind of like what we do with a doctor. Doctor tells you something that you don't like. You have to start uh, you have to start uh, staying away from sugar. You go to a different nutritionist, right? You don't like what he says. You go to, so in halakha, person may say, who are these rabbis? Why should I listen to you? Are you, uh, you have any authority? And therefore, Masechet Avot comes right after. Because what does Masechet Avot mean? Look at this, the first Mishnah. Moshe kibel Torah misinai. What does that mean? Moshe got the Torah from Har Sinai. And he handed that Torah to Yehoshua. Yehoshua to the Zekinim. Zekinim, and it has all the links of tradition and authority. Therefore, the first the first Mishnah is telling the, the layman, don't dispute the ruling of this judge. Because guess what? Same way if Moshe, Moshe gave it to Yehoshua. Now is Yehoshua as great as Moshe? No, he wasn't. But Yehoshua was the leader. And then the next guy, was he as great as Yehoshua? He wasn't. Sometimes we say, you know, Rabbi, we don't have rabbis like we used to. In Halab, we had this rabbi in Europe. We had this one. We don't have any more Hamuvaja Yosefs. And it's true. We don't. That argument is, is irrelevant. That argument is only, only uh, hurtful. It doesn't accomplish. Doesn't Because you could always make that argument. And by the way, when Hamuvadiyah was alive, they said that to him about the Ben Ishchai. When the Ben Ishchai was alive, they said that to him about Rav Akiva about the Rambam. You can always go higher. Doesn't help. You can't do that. Pasuk says, "Ubatala shofet acheri yeba yamim ahem." You have to go to the judge in your day, and it's irrelevant that he's capable or incapable as much as the rabbis prior. 
You have to accept the ruling of the rabbi of your time. And that is why Avot comes right after Sanhedrin. So that's the first answer addressing, again, the congregation. But the second answer now goes to address the judges. You know, a lot of times, the rules, unfortunately, in the world, we told us a lot in COVID, right? All the rules of you have to mask up, and you have to mask up, and you have to mask up. And then you see all of a sudden pictures of celebrities and uh, judges and, you know, uh, members of Congress that all of a sudden when, you, you know, you see them in places, they're not masking up, right? Just give me, I'll give you a silly example, right? What happened? What happened? Because unfortunately in life, sometimes we feel when we're in charge that the rules don't apply to us, right? Even as parents, sometimes we tell our kids, don't use your fingers, clean your plates. The father's yelling at his son, clean your plate. And then the father gets up and he doesn't take his own plate. Right? But sometimes in life, the rules are neglected most by sometimes the biggest people. I'll tell you a nice, uh, uh, the Kutzka Rebbe. Kutzka Rebbe was very sharp, very strong. Anytime you hear a Kutzka Rebbe thought, you know it's going to be a juicy one. He used to give hard. So the Kutzka Rebbe, one time, he said, uh, the Pasuk says, Et Hashem What does that mean? You should fear God. But it begins with the word et. Et, what is et including? Et always includes, like an example. Aver et avicha. Respect your father. But it says et. So it's adding. Respect your father and your mother. And the word et is adding even your brother. You have to even respect your brother. Or your in-laws. Okay, so always it adding something else to the equation. It Hashem you have to fear God. What is the word it adding? So the Gemara says, adding rabbis. So again, the simple way of understanding that sentence is that you have to even fear not only Hashem, but you have to even fear rabbis. What the Kutzka Rebbe said, he said it jokingly, but he said beautifully. Even rabbis have to fear Hashem. That's what it means. Even rabbis. Not that you have to even fear rabbis. No, but even rabbis have to fear Hashem. Because again, unfortunately, sometimes rabbis think they're above the law. And he was talking to his own kind. He was talking to himself. But uh, again, sometimes as leaders, we think we're above the laws. We think we're above the, the halakha. We don't have to pay attention to the system. Therefore, the judge, judge, the Torah says to the judges, right after Sanhedrin, study Avot. You, Mr. Judge, you think you're so superior, you think you're so important, you think that you're a judge, and he's telling others what to do. But make sure your character is flawless. Make sure that you are observing every single thing to the T. And again, sometimes, even myself, as uh, my rabbi told me, you're going to give classes to people. And sometimes the classes remain classes. They can never do that. The classes must be internalized. The lessons that you're giving to others, you have to incorporate it. You can't just give it. You can't just teach it. You must also make sure you're studying Mutsar for yourself. So you have to have a piece that you study that you don't teach. Or else everything that you read is just going to be in your mind. Oh, this is a good piece to teach. Oh, that's a nice idea. And you write it down. But then you never incorporated it for yourself. That's very dangerous. And therefore, you're telling the judges, make sure you study Avot, you have to have good character. You know why? You know why? Because if a judge, if a regular guy has bad character, so it's no good, right? If a judge has bad character, it really impacts all the people under him. When you're a leader. When you're a, a head of a community, when you're an important person, when you're a patriarch of a family, when you're a, a role model, if you have bad character, you're teaching everybody else. When a celebrity gets up on stage and slaps another celebrity, and people look up to that celebrity, so now all of a sudden, people start wondering, maybe, maybe sometimes I'm allowed to do that if someone offends me. Maybe it's okay, right? So you have to make sure that when you're a, when you're up there that your character is impeccable and therefore 
that's why Avot appears right after Sanhedrin, because it's all being to the judges. Now again, he continues with this, and now we'll understand one more piece, by the way. What comes right after Avot? If we go back and we read the list, it said Sanhedrin, Avot, and again, there's different versions. This is the version of this of the Rambam. Sanhedrin, Makot, those are always go together. Then Avot, and what's after Avot? Horayot. What is Horayot doing next? So Horayot, based on what we just said, let's continue the thought. Horayot deals with mistakes that a judge makes. And that is, again, a beautiful uh, last piece to this, uh, to this idea. Because a judge may say, what do you mean? I should study ethics? Why do I have to study? I'm a big rabbi. I'm a big judge. How do you think I got here in the first place? Of course I have good ethics. Of course I'm uh, honest. Of course I have integrity. Of course I have patience. Of course I'm not jealous. Of course I'm not arrogant. Of course, of course. This, uh, I wouldn't be picked if I was. If I'm here, I'm good. The, the next Masechet is Horayot. It's telling the guy, look, even the biggest rabbi can make a mistake. That's what Horayot deals with. Mistakes that a, that a great court issued. So everyone makes mistakes. Everybody is fallible. Therefore, even you, Mr. Judge, go study morals. Don't think they're below you. Don't think that, yeah, I don't need this. Everybody needs this. Okay, beautiful. That's, that's, that's answering a more specific question. Why is Avot here in, within the volume? Why is it here after Sanhedrin? But in other versions, and we'll end with this, in other versions, it appears right after Masechet, Avodazara. Of David Pardo, we quote it sometimes in our Humashi, or he had a commentary on Rashi, Maskila David. He says, over here, he has also a commentary on Pirkei Avot. And he says, why is it right after Avodah Zarah? So he takes us to the famous saying of our rabbis. Our rabbis tell us, Kachi Darko Shela Yetzirah. The Yetzirah has a very interesting method. Yetzirah will never come to you and say, I want you to start eating pork. I want you to go worship uh, Avodah Zarah. I want you to become a, con a convert into other religions. He'll never tell you that. Because he knows you're not going to listen. He's very smart. How does he have to pull somebody down? One step at a time. Then he'll tell you, get a little bit, uh, get a little bit angry. Then you get angry. You give in, you listen to him. And the next week he'll tell you, this time... Hit the guy or, or scream back at the guy. Then the next week, like, okay, now that you scream back, I'll curse him. And then you curse him and then hit him. And then you hit him and you could actually maybe hurt him a little bit more. And then you kill him. And then you kill him. And then he'll take you all the way to murder. Right? But he doesn't start at murder. He starts all the way. Just get a little bit uh, impatient with him. And then he pulls you all the way down. That's the Yitzhara. Not in one shot. Never in one shot. And therefore, a person may say, you know what? Okay, so I don't have the best character. It's not important that I should. Is it so important? Yeah, I don't, you know what? Okay, fine. Maybe I'm a little bit nasty. But I give charity. I don't hit people. I observe the Sabbath. Okay, so maybe I don't have the best character. Is it? Is it the worst thing? The answer is... Yes, because if you don't have good character, that's going to lead slowly, slowly to the worst thing possible. If you don't keep avot, what's coming next is avodah zarah. That's why it's right here, right next to masechet avodah zarah, because that's how it begins. It begins by not being lax, by judging uh, unfavorably. It begins by not smiling. That's how it starts, and that's what leads a person to avodah zarah. Rav Moshe Feinstein once said. Rav Isaac Bernstein quotes this. Rav Moshe Feinstein said, things in life aren't an event, they're a process. Listen to this line. What does that mean? Things aren't events, they're a process. Meaning, things in life, they're not one-time things. They don't happen just instantly. Things happen gradually. When you see somebody, who's maybe far from Judaism, off the derech, that didn't happen overnight. He didn't just become one thing happened and he decided the next day to take off his kippah and to start eating pork 
and to start uh, sleeping with non-Jews. That didn't happen overnight. That didn't happen overnight. That that was a process. You have to. That started many, 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 many years ago. It just it's not something that happened now that he's 23. Boom, something happens. No, no, no. That's a process. It happened gradually. When a couple gets divorced, it's not one thing that happened. It was a dinner, she burned, and we got divorced. Or he said this to me and it wasn't respectful, and therefore we're divorced. It never happens. Divorce happens gradually. It starts with just no longer having anything to talk about and lacking connection. And then over a process, Ramosha Feinstein points out, how many fasts do we have to commemorate the loss of the Beit HaMikdash? Anyone know? Four. Four fasts for the Beit HaMikdash. Why four? Because we didn't lose the Beit HaMikdash in one day. It wasn't just Tisha B'Av, and now we cry. That's not, that's not life. Life begins with Asara Tevet, and then Song Gedalia, and then Sheva Sabet Amuz, and then Tisha B'Av. Things happen in stages. They happen over the process. It takes a lot of time. And, it, and when, when, when one thing happens, and we don't fix it here, it's going to lead to this, going to lead to this, going to lead to this. You know, when, when, there's, when there's things that are going on in a community that are very inappropriate, when there are parties that cross the line, we have to ask, not how could this happen, but what things that we did before allowed for this to happen? Because in the communities here, a person doesn't have a party that's up here. It's only because we, we, we came here right before that now allowed for the next step to happen. So always in life, this is the idea of offense. This is the idea of taking a step back, you know, to, to be able to remember. That's why Teshuvah is also a process. You can't do Teshuvah in one step. Teshuvah, we know, it's not Yom Kippur. Elul, and you have, you know, Shana, and you have the 10 days, and then you have, uh, and then you have Yom Kippur. Teshuvah is a process. Growth is a process. Growth doesn't happen overnight. Mesila Yesharim, my friends. Mesila Yesharim, how does he begin his book? He says, and he quotes, if I could just uh, find it here, right here. Mesila Yesharim, right in the intro. He says, uh, he quotes the, the statement of Rabbi Pinhas ben Yair. He says, in Masechet Abu Dazara, Torah leads to Zehirut. Zehirut leads to Zerizut. Zerizut leads to Nekiyut. Nekiyut to Perishut, to Tahara, to Hasidut, to humility, to fearing sin, to holiness, to Ruach HaKodesh. He can't jump. He can't go straight to Ruach HaKodesh. It won't happen. You want to become great? You got to, let's work on this. There's a friend that you know Maybe someone asked me the other day, my friend, my, it was his boss. His boss is not observing Shabbat. He works on Shabbat. He says, I want him to start, stop working on Shabbat. But, uh, you know, it was very hard for him. I said, okay, so let's, let's make a contract. Maybe he'll, with a partner, and he'll split the profits, and he'll take Sunday, and the, and the guy, he says, yeah, but Rabbi, even if we do that, he's still going to come to the office on Shabbat. So that's okay. It's okay. You're right. We're not going to go right now from breaking Shabbat to completely Shomer Shabbat. He's not going to do that. We got to do it gradually. Even though what he's, even though this step is still completely violating Shabbat, but it's a step in the right direction. Where we saw Salanta when he wanted to turn the community into Shomer Shabbat, you know what he told them? He said, this Shabbat, please make sure you break Shabbat with your left hand. <laughs> Instead of breaking it with your right hand, do a small shinui. Break it. You didn't tell them don't break it. He said, break it with your left. You can't jump with people. It's a, it's a process. Person trying to keep kosher. You can't go from eating pork to now eating only halav Israel. Let's try to get rid of the uh, the pig, and then in six months let's try to get rid of the meat. Let's try to get rid of the crab or the fish. 
Let's try to get rid of the dairy. Then maybe lettuce, and we'll get rid of the vegetables, and we'll even get into the cooking of a Jew. But you want to take the guy from here and make him fully kosher in one day? Can't you know, right? Most people don't grow like that. So it's okay. If there's someone that we're trying to help, don't make them fully, don't give them the halakha to the 100%. You have to give them something that's sw- that's able to be swallowed so that they can comprehend. Of course, you should always speak to a rabbi, get guidance from a rabbi on how to do it the right way. But uh, things in life are a process. It's a process. It says that when we cross the sea, a lady saw at the sea what even the greatest rabbi did the soul. You ever heard of this one? The, the, the maid servant, when she crossed, she saw visions that Yehezkel never dreamed of. But you know what Rav Chaim Shmulevit says? At the end of the day, she remained a maid servant. She remained a, uh, a chadame. She never became a Nabiya. She never became a prophetess. You know why? Because when you jump from maid to prophet, you're going to fall right back down to me. That's how you become a prophet. Life's work. Sometimes you see people that have muscles. Sometimes you see people that are very skinny. You want to, you want to lose weight, 25 pounds in three weeks, all of, these, all of these weight loss things that they promise you instant. To, as fat, easy come, easy go. Right? That's what they say. You can't, there's no shortcuts in life. It's a process. You got to hit the gym. You got to lose every day a quarter, a quarter of a pound a week. Slowly, slowly. You want to become a good tennis player. Right, Joe? You got to hit the courts. You're not going to become, uh, you know, Djokovic uh, by playing three lessons. Got to go every day, slowly, slowly. A process. You want to get close to Hashem. You're not going to start opening a sidur and feeling a euphoria. Slowly. Slowly. Is that Hashem? We'll get it. So that's again the lesson of why Avot is right next to Avodah Zarah. In life, we don't go to Avodah Zarah. It begins with bad character. If we don't work on our character, then it can lead to, uh, to the worst of crimes. Okay, I think it's a very nice introduction, good way to begin Masech uh, Avot. We'll stop over here. Have a wonderful, wonderful day, everybody. God willing, we'll see you all tomorrow. Bye bye.